Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. It's The Inch Show, Australia's only show dedicated to innovation from Adelaide, Australia and across the globe. Hi, this is David Grice and Troy Sincock and once again we're talking about innovators and entrepreneurs, startups, people with great ideas who are making them a reality and the challenges they've faced along the way. How are you doing, David? Going great, thanks, Troy. You know, this week I went to an incredible world premiere of a movie that was made right here in Adelaide. It seems to be a bit of a, a theme for me, but it's not really. I don't see that many movies. I went to the Adelaide Film Festival the week before. This just happened to be this week. <laughs> A couple of guys you know, have documented what's been happening musically in Adelaide over the last three years, just off their own back, a passion project, and it's turned into this extraordinary film. What I thought in seeing it was how relatable this is to the discussions we're having with innovators and entrepreneurs, how everyone connected forms a part of the cycle that if they didn't exist, things wouldn't actually occur. And we're seeing this in the discussions we're having about innovators and entrepreneurs all the time where someone has an idea, but to have that thing become real requires a whole lot of other things to happen. It really is amazing when you do break it down like that and actually see the journey. But also, like you said, the people that influence the path as well. You come to see that no matter how small the contribution, every little bit counts to the forward momentum for a project. And if one of those little elements doesn't line up, it really slows everything down too. Absolutely true. We've got a cracker show again today. Yeah, today we're joined by two speakers at the TEDx Adelaide 2017 event, Zoom Out. We're going to talk with Brad Chilcott. Now, he's a pastor and a progressive thinker, but he's also the founder of Welcome to Australia, which engaged with different cultures both locally and around the world. And I'm really looking forward to speaking with Flavia Tata Nardini, who's currently part of the expert reference group reviewing space capabilities in Australia. How on earth do we put ourselves in this position where we get to speak to such incredible people? It really has been an inspirational week chatting to Brad and Flavia. Yes, absolutely. Claire's going to join us with more in news, including this incredible innovation where they're creating skin for robots to give them the sense of touch. They've discovered that robots can do just about anything else, but touch has been that thing that's been missing. Imagine what that's going to open up. Unbelievable. All right, Claire, what more have you got for us? Cheers, David and Troy. In England, a group of computational psychiatrists have developed a computer model which may have discovered why individuals suffer from anxiety and depression. The computer model was programmed to mimic human thought patterns and was created as part of a study at the University of Oxford. The study found that people with depression tend to focus on negative aspects of their lives because they believe they learn from them more compared to positive aspects. The participants had to choose one of two shapes that appeared on a screen. The correct choice would award money and the incorrect choice would take money away. When the correct choice switched to take the place of the negative choice, participants altered their thinking because the probability changed. The results explain that people experiencing depression sometimes feel bombarded with negative feelings and thoughts because they feel they learn more from negative outcomes. The team is now researching how the negative thought patterns of depressed people can be changed to focus on positive ones. In a world first, Scotland has installed a floating wind farm. High Wind Scotland can produce 30 megawatts of electricity, which can power about 20,000 homes. The five massive turbines are located offshore about 24 kilometres from Peterhead, Aberdeenshire. The turbines are 253 metres tall, but 78 metres of that is actually beneath sea level. This is because the turbines are tethered to the bottom of the ocean by chains that weigh about 1,200 tonnes. Energy companies Statoil and Mazda work together to create High Wind Scotland and their next step is to install a storage battery that can help manage the output of energy. The invention of floating wind farms could encourage countries to turn to renewable energy. Who knows, maybe we'll even see them on Australia's shores one day. In America, a group of engineers have developed a stretchable skin that can give robots the sense of touch. You may not know this, but robots could soon be deployed as first responders. They could be used to venture into places too dangerous for humans, disarm bombs or even perform difficult first aid procedures. But there's one big problem. They don't have the sense of touch. So engineers from the University of Washington and the University of California in Los Angeles have attempted to solve this issue. They've created a human-like skin that can be attached to any part of a robot. The skin mimics the precision and sensitivity of human hands to give robots the ability to feel vibrations and force. The way it works is pretty simple. The skin is embedded with winding channels that are filled with electrically conductive liquid metal. When the skin is compressed or changes shape with movement, electricity flows through the channels and allows it to stretch. 
This breakthrough means that robots could disarm bombs, perform surgeries and more without a remote operator. And that's what's in news this week. Thanks very much, Claire. Well, David, what an innovation that would be. You know, we've heard about the way people are building robots is very much based on studying how humans operate. This goes one step further to almost making a robot human. Well, it's funny you should mention that because down at Hybrid World, I met with a Japanese guy who's a professor at the Osaka University. Now, he's actually made a robot of himself that goes and teaches the lessons. And this robot is so fascinating. It's actually able to answer questions in real time as students ask it things. Now, if a robot then could feel, I just don't know what that's going to open up. But think about this. How on earth are they going to start getting robots to feel emotion? Now, that is going to be an interesting thing. That was immediately what I thought when you were discussing it. I remember seeing a film last year, year before that, that was based very much on that premise. And when I was seeing it, I thought, well, this is far-fetched. This is not going to happen anytime soon. Knowing that skin is next, my goodness. Does this scare you? It scares and excites me simultaneously, I think. Yes. I don't quite know what to think of it. No, I don't either. I mean, you could be a robot right now. Well, I could be. <laughs> it's David Grice and Troy Sincock. We're talking innovation on The In Show, and you can check us out at theinshow.online, Facebook, and follow The In Show on Twitter. Now, next, we'll speak to two people appearing at TEDx Adelaide Zoom Out. We went over to JP Media across from Radio Adelaide uh, just last week to speak with them in person. First up, it's Pastor Brad Chilcott discussing his work, which engages different cultures and provides support to struggling communities. Communities. The In Show. It's all about innovation. Adelaide is starting to be recognised as a smart city, nationally and globally. The City of Churches is rapidly gaining a reputation as the city for innovation. Smart City Innovation is becoming a big part of our future. The Adelaide Smart City Studio is supporting people that are creating new smart city products and services for global markets. What we've taken for granted is now being embraced by residents and visitors alike. Adelaide Smart City Studio, creating opportunity. Hi, I'm Robin Freeth from TEDx Adelaide, and you're with Troy and David on The In Show. It's David Grice and Troy Sincock, and if you've missed an episode, make sure you subscribe to The In Show podcast on iTunes. In the next 10 minutes, we speak to Flavia Tata Nardini, who's currently part of the expert reference group reviewing space capabilities in Australia. The In Show. Brad Chilcott's a pastor and a progressive thinker who's the founder of Welcome to Australia. His work has seen him engaging with many different cultures, both locally and around the world, and has seen the rise of activism where it can provide invaluable support to struggling communities. One of the communities he's really supporting is the gay community. I was surprised to see him wearing a Yes Equality t-shirt when he rocked up for the interview. Absolutely. And and the fact that he's embracing those people and bringing them into his church is, is just something that uh, I had never even considered before. Very progressive indeed. We caught up with him at JP Media and we asked him how he became a pastor in the first place. Well, actually, when I was in uh, high school, I thought I was going to be a rich businessman. We had to write this autobiography in year 12, which the last chapter was like anticipating my future. And I uh, wrote this piece about a, a mansion and horses and sports cars. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> uh, so it's uh, turned out differently to that, that's for sure. How did it take that turn? I grew up in a very religious family and eventually there came a point where I kind of had a faith for myself, not just my my parents' faith. But I did grow up in a very conservative church and it's taken quite a different turn since then as well. So... Tell us about that because, I mean, that's innovation in itself in, in some respects. Explain to me, you know, where it began and where it is now and how that journey took place. The church I grew up in was called Christian Brethren, the denomination, Mm -hmm. but we would go to church and women weren't allowed to speak. They had to wear hats to Sunday services and so we were taught a whole lot of things about the role of men and women in life and in church life and family life. I went through a number of denominations, ended up in the same denomination as Hillsong, which you would have heard of. Um, We pulled our church out of that denomination so that we could include um, the LGBTIQ community in, in every aspect of our church life. Tell me, how does a decision like that come about? We'd been inclusive in concept and ideas for a long time. And then one of our worship leaders, we call them, people that kind of lead the music on a Sunday, came out and said she had a girlfriend and we said, okay, well, the business as usual, like, you know, different than anyone else, we just Mm. keep going. But in the church movement we were in, that was a a big deal. You've got a leader on stage who's out as a gay person. And so that kind of got the ball rolling and eventually we kind of formally informed our denomination that we were going to be fully inclusive in that way and they made the call that that meant we needed to leave the denomination or 
you know, change or leave, basically. And mm. we said we're standing with our friends and, yeah, and it's been beautiful. We've been talking a little bit between Troy and I um, about the church in general is that it's a wonderful institution, but it, it struggles to maintain relevance to now. And the fact that you're doing this is actually one of those steps towards continuing to be relevant to a, a large group of people. What are some of the bigger challenges around, you know, the relevant side of things and getting people into church and getting them engaged in the faith? Well, I think relevance is an interesting word to use as well. Like you can take that in a number of directions. Like is the whole point to get as many people in the doors or is the, the point actually to live counterculturally in a way that is selfless and others focused and directed towards, you know, compassion and generosity? It seems the way of thinking that you're applying to the church is very complementary to the other activities you're involved with, like um, Welcome to Australia. Can mm. you tell me more about that? So Welcome to Australia is a national movement of people that want to see Australia um, characterised or recognised by the rest of the world as welcoming and inclusive and compassionate and I guess also experienced in that way by newcomers to Australia, especially for people seeking asylum and refugees. But our little tagline is cultivating a culture of welcome. So it's really, um, you know, not just a political thing about a certain policy or a, you know, immigration policy or asylum seeker policy, but more, let's imagine a community that um, is characterised by welcome, being welcoming. Let's um, imagine the kind of community we would like to be received into were we to move to a new job or town or um, school or whatever and then build that in our community in which we live and in, then in our nation. So it actually began after the Inverbrachy Detention Centre was opened in the hills outside of Adelaide and there was uh, images of locals uh, protesting against the centre, not because we'd be incarcerating innocent people, but because house prices would go down and criminals would live in the area <laughs> and all of that. And there was one image on TV with a young lad, about 10 years old, holding up a sign that said, sink the boats. And I thought at the time, no matter what you think of or what you think we should do with immigration policy, something's gone drastically wrong when a parent can hand their child that sign and send them out in public with it like it's, you know, mm -hmm. like that's okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we wanted to create a positive voice in what was a very toxic debate, one that would call out the best in Australians rather than just add to, I guess, the sense of division and and vitriol that was around at the time and continues in different forms today. So what do you do? Like, is it a program that has things that people can come to or is it giving welcome packs to people or, or what, what, what exactly is it? It takes a lot of shapes, but here in Adelaide we have a welcome centre in Bowdoin that does a few of the basic things that especially people seeking asylum need, like emergency relief and English lessons and things like that. But it's also a real social hub. So once a fortnight we have a community dinner that is usually about attended by about half um, people seeking asylum and refugees and half locals and volunteers and really one of our ideas from the beginning was that you change people's hearts and minds through relationships more than you do by arguing over a policy or a, or the statistics or, or that kind of thing so mm. it's a great place um, for people to to meet new friends and to get an understanding of the humanity behind the concept that is often being debated. So there's that. Then around Australia, we have a program called Welcome to the Game, which helps new arrivals, especially refugee kids, get involved in sporting clubs. Just started a partnership with the Paralympic Committee, actually, working out how to get disabled refugee um, people into uh, sport, which is kind of niche and very cool. No one's really doing that. And we have another great program called Welcoming Cities, which helps um, local government associations not just say welcoming things, but actually assess uh, what are the barriers to inclusion in our council area and then um, get international accreditation as a welcoming city that they can kind of keep going back and assessing every couple of years, how are we going, are we improving or not, and a bunch of other things. And how do you find the people? Are, are you sort of plugged into the government databases and so forth, or are people just coming to you because they're finding out about you? I mean, the, some of the government-funded settlement agencies refer people to us, but then it really is word of mouth. Once you have one uh, family from Iran or Afghanistan or wherever, then all of the other families know where you are as well. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, they really are provided with very little from the government, depending what visa they're on. And so... 
they really are looking for a, um, a lot of help, especially in the early days of their arrival here. You must be hearing some incredible stories of really hard, you know, journeys out mm. here and, and that sort of thing. Is there anything that sort of springs to mind that you're able to share with us of, of some stories that you've, you've had to encounter and help people through? Oh, I mean, there's one young man um, who just consistently inspires me. He came as an asylum seeker by boat as a child, who was 15 years old at the time, without his parents. You know, went through the detention uh, centre process or torture or <laughs> whatever you, whatever word you choose to use there, <laughs> um, and then ended up living here in the community in Adelaide and. No parents, no support structure except for, um, you know, a case manager who saw every now and then and then the Welcome Centre and some other friends. I went to high school and was awarded Vet Student of the Year for South Australia, got an award for community service from his school and now volunteers at a whole bunch of different organisations, now works at the school supporting other students, studying a double degree at university and working works in a migration agency and is a surf lifesaver. <laughs> oh, wow. Good. So if you just think about that young man's background and what he's now achieving, and he's actually one of the very few people that arrived uh, at the time that he did as an unaccompanied minor who still doesn't have a visa to stay in Australia. Almost everyone else um, in that kind of cohort back in the year when he arrived um, has received their visa and, and he hasn't. And so he could theoretically be deported any time the government chose to do so. And yet he still achieves all of this and contributes back as a volunteer. is really amazing, actually. It's absolutely inspirational, isn't it, that mm. someone you know who could end up with so little sees the opportunity and, and makes yeah. so much of it. You know, and could just be so angry at... Australia and life and mm, yeah. our society and yet just wants to give back. It's, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I'd put you very much in the same category with everything you've been involved with as well. I saw that you were <laughs> an advisor to uh, South Australian Premier Jay Weatherall. I was indeed. Um, and that was all about building communities. It seems that that's a very common thread with all the things that you're involved with, bringing people together. I mean, my main role with the Premier was to um, connect with community groups in the community sector and also... Uh, actually, part of what I did in that role was work with the northern community as Holden was firstly rumoured to be closing and then when it did, you know, the announcement came through that Joe Hockey had chased them out of Australia. Mm. <laughs> um, you know, I was uh, involved in connecting with the communities out there and the Premier and I actually went and visited a whole lot of factories in the supply chain as well and spoke to workers there who were, you know, going to be significantly impacted by the decision for Holden to leave. So... Yeah, it was a really good opportunity actually for me to meet and experience part of Australian life that I hadn't before, meet people and experience those factories and um, those communities. So yeah, it was great. I loved working for Jay. He's an excellent human actually. Mm. With all the communities that you've mentioned, the churchgoers, with refugees, with people from all walks of life, with all the work you're doing, is there some commonality between all these things? Is there, there one thing that is ever present for you when dealing with these in these different areas? I mean, I'm constantly surprised by people's resilience. You know, the, like now I'm amazed at the way that my queer friends are coping with this survey. Like I can't even imagine having my relationship dissected for its validity and, you know, debated about whether the way I am made up is okay and real and, you know, all of these things that we're seeing come out of a lot of the church but also some of our uglier media commentators. And my friends are just copying this with grace and dignity and a lot of them using their, um, I guess, anger at what they're seeing in putting that into a positive expression of, like, you know, let's tell our story publicly and let's get people to, to vote yes on the, on the survey. And, yeah, so I'm, again, amazed at the resilience of, of people to endure so much and yet do it with such dignity and grace. I mean, you're, you're obviously inspiring many, many people through what you do, but what... What do you get? Like, where where's your inspiration come from? I actually just love being involved in people's lives, being improved, whether that's in small ways or, or big ways. You know, I love being involved where I can in the political process and seeing, you know, policy change and things that, you know, impact thousands of people. And I love being able to do a small thing like see... Um, 
a family come to the welcome centre and walk out with a, an armful of food. You know, I lo- mm. like for both of those extremes, I love being a part of it. Outside of everything you've done thus far, is there anything else that you can see on the horizon that you're just waiting for the opportunity to sink your teeth into? Oh, that's a very good question. I've just started working with uh, Pat McGorry on a project called Australians for Mental Health, which will be a coalition of uh, mental health consumers and carers, Yeah, basically fighting for better mental health policy from federal and state governments. So that's probably the next uh, big project I'm going to work on. And so TEDx Adelaide, mm. um, you're one of the speakers only in a few days from now. And so tell us, what are you going to be talking about? Well, you can probably get a few ideas of what <laughs> from what I've said so far. I'm not supposed to give you all the details, but no. it's basically going to be about um, radical altruism and whether altruism is really a thing or whether, kind of like what you asked me before, do you get anything out of this? Do people do good deeds because because it benefits themselves in some way or can you be truly altruistic and love others no matter what the cost is. Pastor Brad Chilcott from Welcome to Australia, thanks for joining us on The In Show. (laughs) Thanks for having me, it was great to be here. (laughs) It's David Grice and Troy Sincock on The In Show. You can subscribe to iTunes and listen to The In Show podcast for more innovations. While you're there, why don't you give us five stars? Next, the second of our TEDx Adelaide guests, space engineer Flavia Tartanardini, talks nanosatellites, connecting devices and Australia's space capabilities. Download the Phoner app before you head to your next event. Find people easier, market yourself better and get connected using Phoner. That's spelled P-F-O-N-R, Phoner. Available in the App Store now. Hi, I'm Nick Condon from Business SA and you're listening to The In Show. The In Show. Now, space engineer Flavia Tata Nardini began her career at the European Space Agency. Nanosatellites have been a really big part of her work for a number of years. And in 2015, she co-founded Fleet to solve the issue facing businesses globally over the next decade about how to connect the more than 75 billion connected devices expected to come online over the next decade, but simply and cheaply. I've got to say, David, you know, there's something about Flavia that has you think that she's still got that childlike enthusiasm and curiosity of a primary school kid. And while we while we were talking to her, you couldn't wipe the smile off her face. She was that excited. And it, it kind of made me excited about it too. Absolutely. Let's hear more. Now, Flavia is currently part of the expert reference group that's reviewing space capabilities in Australia. She's speaking at TEDx Adelaide Zoom out on November 2. And we asked her, how does someone get involved in space? Uh, actually, I was a kid when I started dreaming of it. You know, most probably I was five years old. I was uh, one of those uh, funny kids that really wanted to do very great things. Mm. So I was used to tell my mom uh, that I wanted to be an astronaut and, you know, asking to Father Christmas for a telescope and a rocket and a satellite. And all through my childhood, that was my dream. And then I became a rocket scientist. Yeah. How do you go from the dream of being an astronaut to a rocket scientist? Was it just that the astronaut thing didn't work out or, or did something else capture your attention along the way? I don't know. What I've realised is sometimes you have big dreams, but then the more you grow, grow older, the you really still you get. And I, when I was in high school, I was a really good student. I was not perfect in math, but I thought, okay, what's, what's next? And uh, it was astronomy. I love planets and I love exploration. And, you know, my brothers told me, why don't you try engineering? I'm like, yes. You know, engineering is really hard. So I studied, you know, aerospace and then space. It's not a lot of space at the beginning, just a lot of physics and math. But then, then I, I loved it. And I loved engines, so I became very much specialised in rockets. So tell us about Fleet Space. What what are you guys up to? What are you working on? So Fleet started a couple of years ago. You know, I worked yet many many years in Europe, and then I came to Australia because of my husband. I met him in Europe, and I really wanted to keep working on what I love. And you know, four years ago, Australia was not at the stage it is today. Mm-hmm. So um, I couldn't find a job, and I had to become an entrepreneur. I really love what I do. So for me, entrepreneurship was some sort of only way. You know, I was stuck in a corner, and I wanted to keep doing what I love. So we, we founded this company, uh, you know, with my co-founders with the idea of using these technologies that are called nanosatellites. So very, very small satellites as a big as a shoebox, sometimes even smaller than that. And uh, they are changing completely our access to space. So we found a fleet two years ago in South Australia, in Adelaide, and we said, okay, we want to tackle one of the biggest challenge that we're going to face next 10 years, how to propel the Internet of Things revolution. So it's a difficult concept. It's the idea of, uh, you know, everything around us will be connected. That, you know, in the past 10 years, we have worked to connect us, you know, in a 
smartphone, a tablet. Yeah, for us it's normal, isn't it? No, but it's going to change. And most probably in 10 years, we're not going to have an iPhone anymore. And we're going to have things around us that are going to connect for us. So this is what we do at Fleet. We're deploying 100 satellites called nano satellites to create this internet for every side of this globe to connect things. So how have you found the, the process here with starting up and, and sort of beginning from virtually nothing? Has it, has it been something that's come fairly easily or, or have you found it a, a big struggle to get to where you're at now? I mean, realistically, when I came to Australia, there was one space startup in the entire country. So this wasn't Silicon Valley. It mm. was just, what is she doing? Well, it was more like that. I don't know. She's maybe got experience and the team has got experience, but... Why is she not moving to U.S.? You know, I always say that if I just had one penny for everyone that told me move to U.S., I'd be the richest girl, be multi-billionaire. But I, I'm not yet, okay? <laughs> but that's a that's a reality. But what happened in the past three years? Just because most probably of these very bold entrepreneurs that say, I don't care. You know, this is globally, you know, world changing tech, and I'm gonna do it, no matter if you're gonna come with me in the journey or not. So this is what we did. And, you know, we brought investors on board and we changed completely everything. And now South Australia is the center of space, you know, and uh, all in you know, that something like 65 space startups in the country after three years. Hmm. And, you know, more than 20 million of private investment. Yeah, this is the new Silicon Valley in three years. That's great, isn't it? And, and from a capital raising point of view, has that been mainly from Australian uh, financiers or has it been Absolutely. overseas? Yeah, that's yeah. fantastic. We raised the five million in Series A and again, there was no hope to find them in Australia, but here we are. We found, you know, some investors were in San Francisco, but mainly, you know, our VC found and uh, it's Blackbird in Sydney and Mike Cannon Brooks, that is, you know, one of the most lover of tech, mm. you know, in the uh, best co-founders in, in Australia. So, yeah, you know, we are capital raising again. And, you know, there is so much hope that Australia will keep supporting us. It's amazing. Tell me about that point, you know, where you didn't have a job and you were looking to, you know, create something and decided, I'm just going to have to do this for myself. What were the first steps that you took? You know, interesting enough, when I came here, um, I had my first daughter. She is now four, four and a half. So I was, uh, you know, a high-skilled, high qualified housewife taking care of a you know, newborn, so it wasn't easy. <laughs> you need a lot of skills, though, to yeah, do that anyway. That is worse and more complicated than rocket science, and no one actually tells you how to do that. No book. You know, where is the book? Where can I study this? So it was eight months of raising a little kid. I'm overqualified. There is nothing for me. And should I just find a job in a mining company or do something about it? And then it wasn't easy. You know, it was a lot of thinking, but just a bit of bravery. And there you go. Fantastic. What about in terms of, you know, building the team? Because clearly, you know, you haven't done it alone. How did you get the team together? So it was uh, the co-founders for a long time. And then when we went to Series A and we started the activity in April. So we got our facilities here in Adelaide, but also offices around the world. So we had to grow from three people to, you know, almost 20 in like four months. And this is family. You know, it's the first part of a company like that, you know, doing some more changing technologies. But Fleet is the very first space start to raise capital in Australia. So I can see we are the little darling of Australia. And we had 400 CVs in a week. Mm, and you know, and wow. then I could see how much talent is out there because our universities are great. And there were so many great people working in companies that are not fair with their knowledge. And you know, we're herding them all and bringing them here in Adelaide. How do you go through the process of selecting your team from 400? What, what does someone have to do to get a job with you? That someone that selected all those was me, okay? So we are not a big company enough to have an HR manager. So, And also, this is what we have to go through is a dream. You know, you have to have the right people that jump with you in this dream, in this journey, to bring a company from few people and some capital raising to a worldwide selling company that's going to change everything. So, yeah, this election was really like, is, is this a dreamer? Is this qualified to do that? Is his best in his, what he does? You know, and is it going to be a culture of fit? So it's not easy. Talking about capital raising for a minute, for those people that don't really understand that and its process, you talked about Series A. Could you just explain a little bit about that and what sort of gets you to that point? So when you have a startup, you know, most probably what happens is a couple of friends or co-founders or crazy people that get together with a dream and ideas on tech, uh, at least in a tech startup. And, you know, they work on it to bring the company to a level to usually get what is called a seed. 
So it's so, so probably in the order of, you know, from 50K to, to a million dollars just to have a jump from, from a dream or an idea to a sort of the product, okay? So you prove your idea, you prove your market, you prove your tech. And uh, that phase is not complicated. I mean, we had 50K from the uh, government that is not mattress-based company, but they help you, okay? They help you to do some testing. They help you to do, try some tech. And then is where it's becoming hard because Series A, most probably for tech startups, something like 20% of all the tech startups manage to get there. And in space, it's even less. So this is the moment when you say, okay, I'm going to sell parts of the, my company for shares or, you know, for whatever it is and raise from one to 10 million and go very, very fast and race again and bring the product to the market and do magic out of it. How important is the relationship with your investors? It's critical, okay? First of all, because this is your company, this is your idea, this is your dream, and you need to have space to make it happen. They can slow it down or they can accelerate it. So some people do not understand this, and I wasn't understanding this three years ago, so I was very lucky with my main investor. They're an amazing team. But if you don't understand, if you just want to make it happen and you can get money from anyone, that could be tricky, okay? It's really important. They can accelerate you. They can bring you on a global scale. This is really for brave hearts, really. And so do you find when you're in that situation, are you, are you consistently having to pitch to get more funding? Mm-hmm. Yes, consistent. So you have to have that amazing pitch. And, you know, every time you sit there, I'm a very interesting CEO and I tell this to everyone, I love capital raising, but not simply for the money, for what I learn from on in my company. Sit down, you pitch, you have that deck, you know, those 10 slides of your dream and your idea, your future plan. And you're sitting down and convincing them. And they can, you can see them talking about, have you thought about that? Have you thought about that? And realistically, you didn't. You, you can't just take in everything into consideration. So you come home and say, we have to do that. And we have to do this. You have to do that. So you're like, hey, there's so much to learn here. And I love it. It's great. And, you know, you've got responsibility for the companies. You have to have the best. And you have to do the best. It's, it's, like, it's a real job in mm. itself. Eh? So what is it that's really driving you? Obviously, you know, you've had this passion, you know, all these years since being a, a small girl to now. You know, what is it that really makes you want to have your idea work? I just, uh, you know, space has been always a love of mine. And don't ask me why. You know, realistically, I do not know. I just think that I'm in this, and I have this conversation with my co-founder, Matt, one of my co-founders, Matt Pearson, is the same. You know, these kids that came to this world thinking, this is, this is what I'm going to do. You know, I'm, I'm very much driven by technologies that can change and improve the world. I mean, if you think about Internet of Things, this is the next industrial revolution. We live through the next industrial revolution. How cool is that? Mm. And, you know, if you have the chance to create some tech to enable it, I mean, what Fleet does, it creates new Internet, the new futuristic low-cost Internet. You know, it's not 3G, it's not 4G, but it's for another customer, you know, things around us. And so you enable a change in the world. And why do you do this? Because an industrial revolution helps, I mean, what I really discuss with my team all the time, you know, is this 9 billion people coming to live with us in the world in the coming 10 years. How are we going to feed them? How are we going to, you know, the water, water wastage? People don't think about these things, but this is what keeps me awake at night, you know, and deploying sensors and connect sensors made far working better. I mean, you know, tracking food from one side of the other side of the ocean. We waste 40% of our food in logistic no transport. This is the things that I want to solve. Mm. And, you know, space is space. You know, if you look at, you know, Elon Musk, what he does in his companies, you know, from the Tesla to the battery, to a, he wants to make the world a better place. And, you know, have a rocket for escaping plan if things go wrong. <laughs> because they do go wrong, right? <laughs> so where's Fleet at right now? So we are now, uh, you know, 20 people, the office building the first two satellites that, you know, are going to be launched at the beginning of next year. And uh, we have a product and we work with, with farmers. We work with, uh, you know, companies on the ground and industries and environmental companies, logistic companies. We try really to solve problems. And now we are capital raising again, you know, for the next 10, 10 satellites. You know, this is a space company. Eh? It's heavily intense. So it's, uh, you know, the first satellites that goes going to go online. It goes around every side of the planet. So we can have customers all over the place, mm-hmm. you know. So... 
and he has a little bit of work. You're talking at the uh, TEDx Zoom Out event. How is that for you? You would have been one of those people that have watched many TED Talks over the years, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, realistically, when they asked me, you know, do you want to be part of this? I thought, am I going to do this? That's exciting. And, you know, Fleet per se is a big story, but what I'm, I'm going to try to talk about is one thing that I'm passionate about, that is everything's happening around us, you know, everything, you know, should be driven by fears because what's happening, you know, in this industrial revolution, what a lot of key people are doing in, you know, rockets going to Mars, it's scary, you know, it's scary. And, and I look at it and people ask me all the time, why are we doing this? You know, you said that I'm part of the, this, this reference group working for the space agency, and we're going to have a space agency. This is fantastic. But, you know, people still wonder, why do we need one? You know, what is space? And this is what I want to lock in the mind of everyone. And putting space aside for a second, what else do you see is coming that, that we're not prepared for yet or that, that really excites you? You know, what it really excites me around, and, you know, we have the same fleet, is that there are so many technologies at the same time with a massive speed that are hitting us from different sides. You cannot keep up with. I mean, I'm a rocket scientist, and I try to you know, understand some text, and I struggle, okay? So if I attend a conference talking about artificial intelligence, no one knows, okay, how much it's going to impact what we do, but it's going to be massive. You know, I was talking with my daughter. She's like, when am I going to, you know, have an iPhone? And I said, never, because there are going to be sensors and someone talking to you. And she's like, like Siri, and I'm not, not way better than Siri, okay? <laughs> and she's like, oh, my God, I'm not going to have a phone this is devastating. She's four, you know. Right. And then there is all this technology that sent driving cars and the way our life going to be managed that, again, I don't think she's going to have a car. She's five now. I don't think she's ever going to have a driving license, mm-hmm. you know. I love these things, you know. But some of them I don't understand. I think the public and everyone needs to understand there are so amazing technologies that are coming here. And we do not need to understand them nor fear them. We just have to enjoy them, you know, in the coming five years because they're going to make our life better. Fantastic. Well, Flavia Tata Nardini, thanks so much for joining us on The In Show. We look forward to seeing you at TEDx Adelaide Zoom Out. Thanks for having me. It's all about innovation on The In Show. And if you've got an event you'd like us to highlight, just drop us a line at theinshow.online. You can check us out on Facebook and Twitter as well. Next week on The In Show. We're chatting to Laco Novakovic from Novatech. And now, you know Laco, an interesting character, done so many things, but he started out as a DJ. I did not know that, to think that he came from sort of the same humble beginnings that I did. And uh, to hear him tell his story, you know, had me look at where I am and where he's at. Well, he definitely did something right. And the, the great thing about him, though, he's really evolved and he's now championing all this innovation around music and technology. And we're also going to speak with Jana Matthews, who heads up the UniSA Centre for Business Growth. And when she walked in, she told us that she'd had a 3D printed knee and she was able to walk again in three days. It was unbelievable. Had she not mentioned that, I wouldn't have even known. She heads up the UniSA Centre for Business Growth and talks about the growing potential in small to medium-sized businesses. Once again, Claire will have more weird and wonderful innovations from around the world, like the skin we had on robots earlier in this show. Uh, You can subscribe to iTunes, listen to our podcast, give us a five-star rating if you think we're worth it, find out more about this week's guests and you can share an innovation you're working on because as we've discovered, there's all sorts of people up to some incredible things and follow us on Facebook and Twitter as well. Now, before we go, here's Maya Moalam from Sky and Space Global with some advice on turning your crazy ideas into a successful business. We all have crazy ideas. Most of us just think to ourselves, oh yeah, it's a crazy idea. It's nice that I've had it and you move on with your lives. Some of us think, okay, it's a good idea. Maybe I'll try to do something out of it. And out of these people, very few actually succeed. And I think the main reason for for failures out of the people who actually try to pursue their dream is understanding your own limitations. Just the fact that you had the best idea in the world for a new technology, that doesn't mean that you know how to build a business model, you know how to uh, uh, run a company, or uh, uh, you know how to talk to investors or you know how to uh, uh, handle human resources within your your business. So one of the most important things is to understand that you do not know everything. You have a great idea, great. Find the partners who will help you realize this dream. One of the very common mistakes entrepreneurs do is they never give up on controlling their business. And they might be the world's best engineers, 
but the world's lousiest businessman. The second thing is, you know, we always say pursue your dream. Make sure your dream has some foundation in reality. Ask yourself hard questions. And this is also common when you ask an entrepreneur hard questions on his idea. They think, oh, they're just trying to down ramp me. They don't want me to succeed. But that's not the case. You should ask yourself the hardest questions to make sure that your idea is viable and it's real. And if you do that, all good. That was The In Show. Subscribe to The In Show podcast on iTunes. Presented by David Grice and Troy Sincock. News by Shannon Chamberlain and Claire Murphy. Music by Zach Grice. Produced by Jason Walker. The In Show. Brought to you by Adelaide Smart City Studio. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.